Welcome to Midweek Prayer. Awesome, we're ready. All right, and a special welcome to those who are joining us online tonight. Um, Thank you, Lindsay and team. Um, It's just so amazing getting to worship alongside our students, and it's even more incredible getting to sing a song that was birthed from this house. Um, Good and Kind is so good. Um, So if you've missed it over the past couple Sundays, um, you can actually get the new songs on the Connect Church app, or you can scan this QR code. We hope they bless you in your personal worship time, so help yourselves to that, please. Um, For those of you who don't know me, My name is Logan Hathaway, and I have the honor of serving on team here at Connect. Um, Pastors Devin and Ashley are traveling tonight with some of our overseers, um, doing some work on a work trip. So I have the privilege of speaking with you guys tonight. Um, But before we dive in, I just want to take a moment and thank Pastor Devin and Ashley for this opportunity. And I would love it if you guys would just join me and letting them know how much we miss them and we love them and we can't wait to hear all about their trips when they get back. Yeah. So if you're new to midweek prayer, here's how it works. We start with worship to express gratitude to God followed by a short teaching on prayer or something that inspires you to pray. And then we're gonna have personal prayer time and then we'll come back together at the end and corporately pray for our weekend services. So I'm gonna pray real quick and then we will jump in. Father God, we just thank you for your presence in this place tonight. Lord, we acknowledge that you are good and kind, Lord, and that your word is truth. Father, we ask that you would be with us as we learn from your word tonight, Lord. Thank you that you are faithful to meet us when we seek you earnestly, Lord. Thank you that you speak to us through your word. Lord, I pray that you would increase and that I would decrease and that you would use my mouth to speak the things that you want your people to hear tonight, Lord. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so over the last couple weeks, I've been praying about what God wanted to share tonight, and I landed in Exodus 12, which happens to be the details of the first Passover. And coincidentally, or maybe not, uh, this Sunday, we're actually going to be taking communion corporately together. Um, So I got really excited um, because communion and Passover are deeply connected. Um, So tonight I wanted to share a bit of the cultural context behind Passover and how it ties into communion today, how it matters for us. So for anyone not familiar um, with this account, Passover is when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt after sparing their lives from a plague that would take the lives of the firstborn son of every person and animal in Egypt. And it's one of the most pivotal events in the Bible. It marks the beginning of God's direct dealings with Israel, transitioning from individuals like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to the formation of a nation. The sheer magnitude of this moment is underscored by the fact that nearly 95% of the Bible focuses on events that took place after the Passover, while only about 5% focus on what happened before it. In fact, God commands the Israelites after they leave Egypt to observe the Passover every year to remember what he has done and what he promised to do. So why is Passover such a turning point and why is it relevant to us? As we prepare for communion this weekend, it's important to understand its roots. That's because Jesus established communion during the Last Supper, which is a Passover meal. We see it in Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is being poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Some translations would say new covenant. Jesus fulfilled the prophetic elements of Passover, creating a new covenant through communion. So to understand this, I want us to look at Exodus 12 and see where it all started. This is actually our SOAP reading for today. So if you're newer here, we have a scripture reading plan called SOAP. It's scripture, observation, application, and prayer. Excuse me. And it's how we just encourage each other to stay engaged with scripture throughout the week. So you can grab a guide today. We've got them out in the lobby or online. All right, so Exodus 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, 
Each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. So in Jewish tradition during this time, families would bring a Passover lamb into their home. This lamb wasn't just a random animal. It became a part of the family. It lived with them in the days leading up to its sacrifice. Can you imagine that? Like, lambs are cute, y'all, and you're living with this thing. The family would get attached to it. The children are probably naming it. They're feeding it table scraps. And by the end of the week, the sacrifice was no longer abstract. It was personal. It cost everyone in the family something. The lamb started out with inherent value because it's one of God's creatures, but it becomes precious and personal due to proximity, time, and care. And the same is true about our relationship with Jesus. We should have a personal connection to him as our Passover lamb. Communion should never be taken casually. It's not a ritual. It's a remembrance of the sacrifice, an innocent lamb, Jesus, who died for our sins. So now we get to verse 7 of Exodus 12. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Mm. Do not leave any of it till morning. If, if some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So if you're anything like me, when you get details like these in Scripture, uh, at first glance, they can seem like oddly specific. Um, Why the door frames and not the roof? Wouldn't that be easier for the death angel to see when it passed over their homes if it was on the roof? If they're preparing to leave in a hurry, uh, which is why they're instructed to only eat bread that has no yeast. They didn't have time to let it rise before they baked it. Wouldn't boiling the meat go faster? Isn't it crazy how we think we know better than God? So when I read this, I'm like, hold up, God, Lord of all creation. I think there's a more uh, logistic, better way that would make more sense to do this. (laughs) Maybe we should just time out and think it through again. But God is in every single detail of his word. He says exactly what he means and what is best. So it's important to slow down and wrestle with those why questions as we're reading scripture. So here's a bit more cultural context we need to understand, I think, to fully understand this. Egyptian homes were made out of clay bricks that were baked in the sun. They were not fired in a kiln. Um, So they weren't very strong. They didn't last very long and they needed to to be replaced really frequently. Um, Because those bricks weren't particularly strong, they couldn't support the weight of a decent, thick door, which was needed to keep out unwanted animals and intruders. So what they would do is they would build lintels and doorposts out of stone. They were the security point of the home. In fact, part of the Egyptian beliefs at the time was that their eternity, their eternal life, was tied to their names. So they would carve their names and the names of all of their family members into the lintels and doorposts of their homes, the part that didn't wear away, that didn't get replaced. So, okay, cool, that's the Egyptians. What does that have to do with Hebrew homes? Uh, When I was reading this, I actually wrote in the margin of my Bible, this is how I engage with scripture. I just ask all kinds of questions, but I wrote, wait, I thought the Hebrews lived in tents on the edge of town. Tents don't have doorposts and lentils. We see this back in Genesis 47. The Israelites had just come from being a nomadic, tent-dwelling people. Joseph told them to live on the edge of town in a place called Goshen, so he could care for them and they could wait out a famine. 
He likely wanted them on the edge of town because he didn't want them to mix with the Egyptian culture, and so they could speedily depart back to home after the famine in Canaan was over. But then, they acquired some stuff. Sound familiar to anyone? We like to acquire some things, don't we? So it's easy to imagine that the Israelites, who have been living there for hundreds of years at this point, have most likely adopted some of the same practices as the Egyptians. They've bought into the culture of the land. They've moved from tents to more permanent housing. What was intended to be a temporary reprieve from famine became the place where they settled. Their homes would have been built similarly to the Egyptians, and they most likely wrote their names on the lintels and doorposts of their their homes as well. So when we talk about the blood of the lamb of Passover being spread on the lintel and doorposts, they are quite literally spreading the blood of the lamb over their names. This holds such significance when we look at what it foreshadows in Jesus, what his blood does for the names of all of those who believe in him. The blood on the doorpost symbolizes their trust in God, not their own strength or security. Remember, the doorposts in Egyptian culture represented protection, but God was teaching them that only his provision through the blood of the lamb could save them. They're setting the stage for what's to come many, many hundreds of years down the line. To take it a step further, at the time of the first Passover, lambs were considered sacred in Egypt. It was unimaginable that you would sacrifice a lamb for anything. In fact, back in Exodus 8.26, when Pharaoh was telling Moses that he could just stay put and make sacrifices to their God without leaving the city, Moses says this, it would not be right to do that because what we will sacrifice to the Lord our God is detestable to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice what the Egyptians detest in front of them, won't they stone us? We must go a distance of three days into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he instructs us. So back in Genesis 46, when the Israelites moved to Egypt, Joseph instructed them to tell Pharaoh that they are shepherds so that he will force them to live on the edge of town apart from the Egyptians. It says in Genesis 46, when Pharaoh addresses you and asks, what is your occupation? You are to say, your servants, both we and our ancestors, have raised livestock from our youth until now. Then you will be allowed to settle in the land of Goshen since all shepherds are detestable in Egypt. You see, sacrificing a lamb was no small act. It took courage. Remember back in Exodus 12, 9, where the Israelites were told to roast the meat and not to boil it? You could slaughter a lamb out back of your house, get rid of the blood, and bring it inside to boil it relatively quietly. I know that feels weird to us because none of that seems easy to us, but to them, it could have been done. But to roast an entire lamb required a big fire. That means cooking it outside or you'd burn your house down. So we go from this fear of being stoned over sacrificing a few lambs to every family taking a lamb. That's over 250,000 lambs by many historians' estimation. And then roasting the entire thing, which takes hours, by the way, out in public, and then smearing the blood on their doors. So you read that, Or maybe it's just me. And that seems absolutely insane. It just seems insane to us. But this was a very public, risky, intentional declaration that they were trusting in God, not the strength of their own hands or culture. It's like God, when he gave them the order to sacrifice lambs, was asking them to cut all ties, to burn some bridges to the ground, as if he was saying, pay attention. When this is all over, you can never come back here. Why? Because God knew their hearts. He knows our hearts. He knew that they were going to spend 40 years in the wilderness after the Exodus and that they'd make it, oh, all of about two weeks before they wanted to go back to Egypt. 
he needed there to be a physical break to prevent them from going back while he did a spiritual work of freeing their hearts. So hey, what are the things that you need to break off so that he can do a work in your heart? Things that you need to physically say, nope, I'm not going back there. I can never go back there. You see, God was slowly turning them to no longer see security in physical doorposts, but in eternal, internal ones. Hebrews 8.10 puts it this way in the message paraphrase, and I love this. Heads up, the days are coming when I'll set up a new plan for dealing with Israel and Judah. I'll throw out the old plan. I'll set up, I set up with their ancestors when I led them by the hand out of Egypt. They didn't keep their part of the bargain, so I looked away and let it go. This new plan I'm making with Israel isn't going to be written on paper, isn't going to be chiseled in stone. This time, I'm writing out the plan in them, carving it on the lining of their hearts. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. They won't go to school to learn about me or buy a book called God in Five Easy Lessons. They'll all go to know me firsthand, little and the big, the small and the great. They'll get to know me by being kindly forgiven with the slate of their sins forever wiped clean. So back to our main passage in Exodus 12. Verse 12 tells us what happens after the sacrifice and the preparation of the Passover meal happens, after the application of the blood on their doors. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So just as the blood of the lamb spared the Israelites from death, Jesus' blood shed on the cross spares us from eternal spiritual death. His sacrifice was the ultimate fulfillment of Passover tradition, calling us to shift our trust from earthly securities and doorposts to his divine grace on the doorpost of our hearts. Think about your own life for a moment. Are you still relying on things that feel like security but aren't? Like the Egyptians who trusted in their stone doorposts, we often put our faith in things like careers, relationships, or personal strengths. But just as the Israelites needed the lamb's blood to be saved, we need the blood of Jesus to cover and protect our lives. His sacrifice is our security. The act of applying the lamb's blood on the doorpost wasn't just an act of private faith, but a public declaration of their trust in God. Similarly, as followers of Christ, we are called to live our faith openly, even when it goes against cultural norms. We just came out of a whole series about that. It's really important. During his last Passover meal, Jesus instituted the practice of communion. We see it in Luke 22, 19 through 20. He broke the bread and he took the cup, telling his disciples to remember him. The bread represented his body broken for us and the wine symbolized his blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus was transforming the Passover into a new covenant, fulfilling its prophetic symbolism. Living with the lamb before its sacrifice points us to the importance of walking closely with Jesus in our daily lives. Just as the Israelites grew attached to the lamb, we are called to live in relationship with Jesus, remembering the personal cost of his sacrifice. As we take communion, 1 Corinthians 11 reminds us to examine ourselves, to reflect on our hearts and our lives before we take communion. Just as the Israelites applied the lamb's blood to their doorposts, we must apply Jesus' sacrifice to our lives. Jesus' blood covers our sins, offering us eternal life. We get the choice of whether or not we apply it. It does no good if we don't apply it. In the same way, as the Israelites couldn't go back after sacrificing lambs, 
Communion is a reminder that through Jesus, we are called to break with our old lives of sin. His sacrifice represents a new covenant, one that frees us from slavery to sin, just as the Israelites were freed from Egypt. Jesus is our Passover lamb. His blood covers us, protecting us from spiritual death. So communion is not just routine. It's a sacred remembrance of the greatest act of love and sacrifice in history. So before we take the bread and the cup of communion together on Sunday, I thought it would be great for us to reflect on what needs to be sacrificed in our own lives. Are there old ties, habits, or sins that God is asking us to break away from? Like the Israelites who couldn't return to Egypt after the Passover, we can't return to our old lives after experiencing the freedom that Jesus offers. So I want us to take some time to pray and to prepare our hearts. Um, like I mentioned before, we're gonna be doing corporate communion on a Sunday, but we also have it available for you here at the altar. If you would like to take communion individually tonight, we definitely encourage that. Um, we have prayer guides available for you as well, and we'll have music playing so you can feel free to pray out loud. You can pace, you can come to the altar, whatever makes you feel connected to God. As long as it doesn't distract other people, we're here for it. Um, so we would just like to let you guys take some time to pray together, and then we're gonna come back and close out together here in just a few.